This is Dr. Bobby Lazara. I'm here today with world-renowned cardiac surgeon, Dr. Albert Starr. Dr. Albert Starr is known as the first cardiac surgeon to successfully implant an artificial heart valve in a human being. Beyond that, he is the winner of the Lasker Award, the United States equivalent of the Nobel Prize, and perhaps soon to be a Nobel laureate himself. Dr. Starr, welcome. Yeah, thank you. September is a big month. It marks the anniversary as I understand it, the 50-year anniversary of the first successful heart valve implantation in the history of the world. Yeah, that's true. Tell us about it. Tell us how it all began. Tell us about the story with Lowell Edwards. Yeah. Well, first I'd like to say it's great to be alive on the 50th anniversary, you know, not everybody could say that. But I was just a kid, practically, when we put the valve in. But what happened was I started at the medical school here in Oregon, and Lowell Edwards came to visit me. Uh, about the first year I was there and wanted to build an artificial heart. And I told him, we didn't even have valves at that time. If we we're going to build a heart, we need to at least start out with some valves. And so let's do the project with one valve at a time. And then when we got all the valves done, we go to the heart. So we started a collaboration. How did you come up with how this valve should look? What, what, it, it was a very simplistic design. But uh, how did that come to fruition? Well, at that time, there were no materials available that had a history of use inside the circulation, except for vascular grafts that had just come out. And these vascular grafts were made of Dacron or Teflon fibers. So we knew that if we wanted to put a sewing ring around this valve so it could be sewn in place, that we did have access to materials that could be used in the sewing ring. Now beyond that, we looked for other materials as well. One was silicone rubber, or silastic is what the trademark name is. That was a material that was used for vascular shunts to treat hydrocephalus, where the brain fluid is accumulating too fast, and you put this little silicone rubber tube up into the ventricle of the brain, and then the other end goes into the vein, and the fluid drains off. So we knew that silicone rubber or silastic would also be a good material. What were the initial steps here? My God, we're going to make a heart valve. No one had ever done it. So everybody's got a great idea. But operationally, what happened? How did you get started with uh, Lowell Edwards? We, we discussed the physiology of the mitral valve, normal mitral valve. Now, the normal mitral valve has two zones of attachment inside the heart. One is to the opening between the uh, atrium and the ventricle, but the other is the leaflets are supported by delicate cords that keep the leaflets from prolapsing or moving out of place. And so uh, we had to decide, do we want the valve to have these two zones of fixation, or can we develop a valve that we could fix only to the opening into the chamber and not worry about the cords? Once you made these moves, these decisions, once you had a valve, what next? What were the initial surgical approaches? Well, once we had a valve, we finally got, had a solid Teflon base, and we had silicone rubber or silastic leaflets, and these were mounted on that base. Around it was a sewing ring of Dacron cloth, so we, we would have to put them in experimental animals to see if they were, would function appropriately, especially without these attachments on the inside through the cords to the inside of the pumping chamber. What were your initial thoughts as an investigator the first time that you placed one of these in uh, an experimental animal? Did you think it was going to work? Did you think this was just a crazy idea, we'll never get there? No, we thought it would work, and that was confirmed by the fact that the experimental animal survived the operation uh, in a large percentage of cases, because it was big surgery. We'd have to use a heart-lung machine, open the left atrium, take the dog's valve out, put a new valve in. It would have at least a 15 or 20 percent mortality rate. But uh, the dogs showed excellent circulation after the implant. How do you go? from a canine model to a human. What were your thoughts? 
What, what was that transition like? Did you know that you were going to change the face of medical history? No, we didn't know we were making medical history at the time. We were just doing the best we could. But uh, being first in man, that is, when to switch from animal to man, is a very complicated uh, issue. And uh, what, what gave us the opportunity was that there was no other treatment. So patients were literally dying in the hospital of mitral valve disease, and the cardiologists just threw up their hands. There was nothing that they could do. And, the, and they said, Al, you've got to put these valves in patients because he's, uh, they, they're dying. And, and if you can get the dog to survive, you should be able to get a patient to survive as well. They have no other chance. So it was the desperation that facilitated the decision to, make, to, to go into man. The first patient, do you still recall it? Yes. Uh -huh. What were your thoughts, not during the surgery, but the night before? Well, you know, the operation had become more or less routine. And it was just part of the ball game. And so uh, he was a patient who was literally dying in an oxygen tent. She was a young woman. Uh, she needed something done, and, and we did have a kennel full of living dogs with valve replacement, so we felt confident that we could do it, and, uh, and the operation itself in man was easier than it was in the dogs. Explain that to our viewers. Easier in man than in dogs. Well, because in, in, in man we had this great big heart to work with, the dogs had a little heart. Uh, in, in humans, the, uh, the atrium uh, was very dilated because of the valve disease and the easy access to the mitral valve, which is much more difficult in dogs. And also, humans were tougher. Their uh, heart muscle was able to resist uh, lack of oxygen a lot better than the dog was. So, uh, all in all, it was definitely an easier and safer operation in man than in dogs. The initial results in humans. How were they? This was the 1960s. Right. It was the beginning of open heart surgery in adults as we know it, even in children. Yeah. We lost the first patient. Hmm. And that patient came back to the intensive care unit, which we didn't have a real intensive care unit then. It was just an improvised intensive care unit. Uh, and it was in fine shape. And then uh, we were getting an x-ray that night to make sure her lungs were fully expanded and so on. We, we saw that there was uh, air fluid level inside the chest and interpreted that as being air in the space around the lungs, but actually it was air inside the heart. And when we sat her up for the x-ray, the air escaped into her vessels going to the brain and she had a massive stroke as a result and did not survive. So we, uh, first, the first case was resulted was a failure However, she was in good shape until that event occurred, and so we knew the next one would be fine if we could avoid that complication of what we call air embolism. Had that occurred in the dogs? Had you any thought that perhaps that was going to occur in her, or you learned, unfortunately, from uh, this bad experience? Yeah, well, we learned, unfortunately, from that experience, because the dogs had a very small atrium, and. Uh, that no significant amounts of air were accumulating in the dog. We never saw that complication in more than 100 uh, dog operations. That We saw it on our first human operation, and since we understood the cause of death and we knew how to prevent air from accumulating in the heart in the future, I felt confident that the next patient would do fine, which they did. There's an anecdote about you that I recall being told when I was a young cardiac surgeon. And the anecdote revolved around you presenting a paper at a very, very well-known uh, cardiothoracic society meeting and receiving a standing ovation. Yeah. And my understanding is that is the only time that has ever happened in the history of this association. Well, up to that point, yeah, it was the first. But what happened was that uh, it was a paper was being presented on multiple valve replacement, and this is in 1963, before the American Association for Thoracic Surgery. And 
it, at that time, just a single valve replacement was a big deal, and replacing two valves at the same time was a big operation. And so the authors were very proud of their accomplishment, and they were invited discussants after the paper was presented. And so I was one of the invited discussants. I got on, onto the podium, and I had a, a movie of a triple valve replacement in the box, ready to go. And I started my uh, 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 remarks uh, congratulating the authors on doing the double valve replacement, but then mentioned sometimes three valves have to be replaced, and I nodded to the uh, operator to start the, the, the uh, 16 millimeter film at that time, he, and the film comes on the big screen showing three valves in the heart moving up and down the living patient. And that was when I got the standing ovation. How old were you at that time? I was 28 years old. Just a kid. Take us briefly, quickly, through the evolution of heart valve surgery, beginning with your valve, and where we are now, and where you believe we're going to be in 10 years. Yeah, that's a good question. And the, the next step after mechanical valves, these mechanical valves are made of artificial materials, not bi of biological origin. So blood clotting was a real problem on their surfaces. So the next major step was the development of biological valves, that is, valves made out of tissue. So early on, some of them were living tissue, like a homograft, a valve taken from one person and put into another. But the durability of those homographs was, was not good, and they were attacked by the body's immune system. So the next step was a tissue valve from an animal but the animal tissues were treated in such a way as to produce no rejection reaction from the body. And that was the second big advance with the tissue valves. And then the third big advance is the introduction of tissue valves without surgery, just using a catheter-based technology. How close are we to making that a reality? Catheter-based valves, that is, not opening the chest, going up leg vessels and deploying valves. Well, it already is a reality, and it's going through the vetting process, so the clinical trials of the device uh, percutaneous valve uh, has, have been, are being completed this year. The report will be given to medical groups, and I think the reports will be very satisfactory, and the FDA will probably turn it loose in 2011. Did you ever think? Did you ever have any idea that when you implanted the first artificial heart valve in a human being, that years later, 50 years later, this is where we would be? Were you thinking that far ahead? We didn't know exactly the pathway, but we thought we would certainly get to the artificial heart, which is where our, what our main project was at the beginning. And we're getting very close to that, but are not there yet. Who are your mentors? Did you have a mentor? Was there someone that helped direct you? You were a pioneer. Yeah. Was there anybody to help you? Oh yeah, I've had great mentors. I mean, it started with Alfred Blaylock, because I was one of his interns, and then with Denton Cooley at Johns Hopkins, and I was, at the same time as my internship, he was a senior resident. And then, uh, very importantly, there was a guy named Max Chamberlain from New York who, who invented a really important pulmonary operation, but who was one of the great technicians of surgery. And I used him as a prototype for developing the technique that we needed uh, for valve replacement. It was, it's an elaborate technique, a lot of different steps to it, and it has to be orchestrated very tightly. And, and his method of orchestrating surgery was just beautiful to watch, and that's what we did. Outside yourself, was Dr. Chamberlain the best technical surgeon that you've ever seen? Uh, well, he was, he was good, but, he, but they had different styles. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, John Kirkland, who had the, headed the Mayo Clinic program for a long time and then went to the University of Alabama, he was a great surgeon, a very uh, beautiful orchestrator of events, very delicate, uh, like, like, almost like a ballet dancer whereas Chamberlain was like a break dancer. He was exuberant and moving swiftly in big motions. They were both different styles, but they came out the same way. It's really beautiful works of art. Where are you now in your career? What are your plans? Um, 
Most people will think that you've done and you've seen it all, yet you're still quite active. Well, what I've done is I've gone from the factory floor to management. See, and there's no better uh, way of being trained for management is to actually see the product from the ground up, to see surgery from the ground up, to see the development of heart cardiology and medicine in that field, and to be a part of it, and then to get to a point where the judgments that you have learn from that experience you could then use in a management capacity. Uh, I've had the opportunity to read your memoirs. Uh, wonderful book, very engaging. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, um, people will really get the opportunity to understand uh, who you are as an individual and a surgeon and um, uh, how your accomplishments have really marked um, uh, 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 an incredibly important time in, uh, in, in medical, medical history. Um, what's your favorite part about that book that you wrote? Oh, the favorite part? Well, I think the favorite part is uh, the idea that the, led to the breakthrough, the, the single idea that led to the breakthrough that enabled us to get animals to survive mitral valve replacement. It came to me as I was bounding up the stairs of the research building. It was February, and in Portland, Spring comes really early in the year and the cherry blossoms were in bloom and I looked at the cherry blossoms and My mind wandered and this idea came to me just out of the blue as to how to solve the, the problem of Clotting of the valve in dogs and with that solved we were then able to go ahead in, in man It was the cherry blossoms that did it. Yeah. Dr. Starr. I'd like to thank you for your time today um, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. This is Dr. Bobby Lazara for MDI-TV. It's good for you.